first, second, and last verse. I am thine, O Lord. kids sure glad to have y'all all up here today you look so handsome and pretty today now I want to talk to you about something really small I've got a story for you that's about small things and you kids are still small and you're still growing so y'all know what small is about well small things can turn into big things and I want to tell you a story to let you see that all right <clears throat> There was a pastor one day, he had come to town, and he was, he was new to town, and he was at his church, and his church had a nice library where he could go and study, and he could get ready to uh, prepare his sermon for the coming Sabbath. And his library had a lot of nice books, and he had been working hard all afternoon, and it had gotten dark. It was dark outside, <clears throat> but he knew it was time to go home. So he put down all his studies, and he left his library, and he walked out into the street. And he walked down the street just a little ways to where the bus stop was. And then he stood and waited. He's waiting on the bus. He's going to ride the bus on home. Well, sure enough, he could hear that bus rumbling over in another street. And next thing, he saw it turn in the corner, and it was headed up to his bus stop. And he was thinking, oh, I'm tired. I'm ready to go home. It's going to be nice to have a quiet bus ride home. And here comes that bus, and it came up to his stop, and the door opened. He walked up those stairs, and then he pulled his money out of his pocket and he handed his cash to the bus driver 
and the bus driver gave him back some change and he put the change in his pocket. And then he went back to the back of the bus and he sat down. Well, something was gnawing at him. Something was talking to him. That something was the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was saying, you need to check your change. So he reaches down in his pocket and he pulls out the change that the bus driver had gotten got that given him and look there it was all that change and he said oh look the bus driver had given me out of the small the smallest coin in my pocket he had given me 10 cents too much <laughs> do you do you like money yeah well, let me ask you something. Can you do anything with a dime? You can. What would it buy you? What would, what would a dime buy any of you kids? This is just a small coin. Not, <laughs> Jed's got it. He's doing this. <laughs> Nothing. <clears throat> now when, <laughs> when I was your age, this small little dime was a treasure. Because a dime would buy me a Snickers candy bar or Reese's Cups. And, and, and I just loved being able to find dimes. They were valuable, really valuable, when I was your age. Now here's this pastor. And he's going, this dime's not that much. I don't need to give this back to the bus driver. My goodness, I've went, I went to Walmart the other week. Because they had mistakenly put something in my bag that wasn't mine. And I took it back to Walmart, and they didn't even want it. Sit down, babe. They, they didn't even want the stuff back. I don't need to turn this dime back to that bus driver. And he kept thinking about it and rationalizing and thinking, I don't need to give this back. But here comes his stop, and it was time to get off the bus. It was time to go on home. And so he walked on up to where the bus driver was, and he reached in his pocket, and he found that dime. And he said, sir, you gave me too much money. And the bus driver said, I know. He said, you see, aren't you the new pastor that came to town? And the and the pastor said, well, yes, I am. He said, well, you know, me and my wife used to go to church all the time. And we got really busy doing things. And, and we kind of stopped going to church. And two weeks ago, my wife died. And he said, you know, I've been thinking how I want to come back to church. And I wanted to find out first what kind of a man you were before I came to your church. So the pastor greeted him, invited him to come to church, and he got off the bus. And then he stood there, and there was a traffic pole right there, and he was leaning on it. And his legs were all shaky and wobbly, and then he just kind of fell down to his knees, and he said, Lord... I'm sorry that I almost sold out Jesus for a dime. The little things matter, don't they? The little things really matter. Well, today, kids, I want you to listen even more closely to Pastor Rick because he's been telling us great stories about a man named Daniel. Daniel knew that the little things mattered. Daniel knew that the little things like being living a healthful life were so important that he decided to do that above anything else that was given to him. And because Daniel made the decision to keep to to keep the small things, the things that that don't seem to matter, he was able to influence a king and a whole nation for God. So y'all remember the little things do matter. And let's keep our hearts straight before Jesus, okay? All right, y'all can go back to your seats now. Uh, let's, let's all kneel as we seek the Lord in prayer.
Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that before Jesus left, that he gathered his disciples together and he, he taught them how to pray. We know that prayer was extremely important for the success of Jesus' ministry here on earth. And if your son had to pray, Lord, how much more do we need to pray constantly? Thank you so much for the privilege that we do have to come to you and pray. Lord, we have so many things to be thankful for. You have blessed us abundantly. You, you provide the air for us to breathe. And, and you said we are more valuable than little sparrows and you take care of them. So Lord, we don't have to worry about the things. You told us to seek your kingdom first and all these other earthly things will be added unto us. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to get our priorities straight. Thank you so much for the privilege of being in a group of people that love you and love each other. Lord, we want that love to ma be manifested to the community around us. We know that your kingdom is built on the principle of love. And without love, we have nothing. And so, Lord, we pray that our hearts will be softened. Help us to see ourselves who we really are. And that we're no better than anybody else out there. But that we have something special, and that's you. And just like Peter and John, when they went to the temple to pray, and they saw the layman there and said, we don't have anything physical to give you, but we got something better. Lord, and I pray that as we go out in the community and we interact with people, that we don't necessarily give material things to them, even though that's, that, that's important. But Lord, help us that we will pass along you that's more important than anything else to those around us. We know you're coming soon, Lord. We know that you have called us for a special purpose, and that is to be the light of the world. And we pray, Lord, that you will help us to be a bright light in our shining corner. Lord, all of us have come here this morning with, with concerns and with praises. Lord, we think of those who are sick. We know that you couldn't stand seeing those people when you were here on earth and you healed everyone you saw. We know ultimately you'll bring healing in the, in the resurrection and when you come. And we pray, Lord, that you would come soon. Most of all, Lord, we pray that you would soften our hearts today, that we will receive the message that you've sent through Pastor to give to us. Help us that we will not leave here saying, boy, oh, it's a good message, but that we'll say, Lord, we want you to change us because of that message. So we lift Pastor up. We pray that you speak through him to us. And when we leave here, Lord, we pray that we'll be different people. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. study group last night we talked about how God alone can protect us we think we can protect our children we can teach them to ride a bicycle and then watch them crash all we can do is watch how many times I was a very protective father and yet I soon learned that I couldn't protect my own children it was foolish to think I could only God can protect our children. I learned to leave them in His hands. I've had boys go around the world living in Central America and some of the most dangerous countries in the world. And yet I was at perfect peace because I had left them in God's hands. And I knew He could be trusted. How many of us here have had life-threatening situations in our lives? It wasn't our parents that were protecting us, was it? It was God Himself. What I love about this song is it was written in 1529 by Martin Luther. He, I read Eric Metaxas' book and he fully expected to be martyred. That's why he waited so long to be married. He couldn't figure out why they hadn't killed him. 
In fact, he was jealous of two of his students who were burned in the square, and I think it was Amsterdam, because they were martyred, and not him. Probably if he realized he was going to die feeble, disease-ridden old man, he would have really wanted more to be martyred. But the point is, <laughs> he left us quite a history as it was. And uh, so, God is our fortress. God is our protection. And uh, let's see if I can do this song justice. Ever had one of those weeks? <laughs> I had one. <laughs> Just uh, seemed like a lot going on, and uh, but you know what? God come true. Daniel four. I said Daniel four. Nobody reads Daniel four. <laughs> Tim, <laughs> why'd you do this to me? <laughs> But I want to tell you, church, if God got Nebuchadnezzar's heart, if he finally reached Nebuchadnezzar, if his grace was able to reach down and save a, a man like Nebuchadnezzar, he can save you. He can get your attention and get mine. You know, most of the world lives like there's not a God. Like he's not even out there. We're our own God. We're, we're so wrapped up in self. Pride. I, I. It's all about me. We are. That's just where we're at. I've been there. I am there. Pray for me. We're just there. But right in the middle of that word I, if you put I right in the middle of it's pride, the very root. We're going to look at that today. Now I, want, I, want, I need your help. We need to pray. At the end, I appreciated your introduction to prayer. Prayer is the very life of our soul. And God honors our prayers. And when we come to Him individually, and especially when we come to Him corporately, God honors our prayers. So I'm, I'm asking that we do something here. God is wanting to touch each one of you. He's wanting to, to open your eyes, to awaken you, to... to to, that you could look at things from the right perspective, that, that we could realize that there really is a God, and He's our Father, and He's trying to save each one of us. So when I pray, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause for maybe, you know, 10 seconds, and I want you, please, to lift up a prayer for yourself, giving God permission to touch your heart today.
to move and stir in your heart today through the Holy Spirit. And then I'll, then I'll have prayer. Let's go. Father in heaven, I'm praying that your Holy Spirit would fall upon us like electric shock from the top of our head to the tip of our toes. May you be glorified. May our eyes be open that we would realize that you are our Father and we are your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hope you brought your Bible. There's power in the Word of God. I'm going to start out with Daniel chapter 4. Picking up in verse 33, Daniel chapter 4, starting in verse 33. That very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men, and he ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven, to his hair has grown like eagle feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. And at the end of time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. I want us to pause here to kind of refocus. Why are we doing this Daniel series? Why has God put it on our heart to do a Daniel series? Is it so that we'll know a, a exact time or, or about time that Jesus is going to come? Is that the reason we're doing this Daniel series? No. Because God is much more interested in you being prepared for His return then you are knowing about when. And I'll use a very uh, a, a, one, a biblical example that you all know about, Matthew chapter 25. God's, uh, this is a, uh, Matthew 24 tells us the condition of the world, Matthew chapter 25, the condition of, of the church right before Jesus comes. And we know in the story of the ten virgins that all ten of them knew, they knew that Jesus, they knew that it was about time for, the, for Him to come, for the bridegroom to come, Right? But we know that half of them were not prepared. That's talking to the church. So we need to be prepared. I think Tim brought this up really well Wednesday night in our Bible study. Don't miss these Wednesday nights Bible study. I'm just able to cover one-tenth of this in a, in a sermon. But we're digging a lot deeper in our Bible study. And, and he brought that up. You know, we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared. The Bible, the Bible tells us that the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel gives us, gives us living in these very last days, and we've already nailed that from, from Scripture, that we are living in the last days. He gives us very special hope and courage and direction and, 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 and even correction and reproof if we need it, right? In, in, in case we need it. So, also think, think about the influence that Daniel and his friends had on Babylon. Think about the influence that they had on the community in which they lived in that day. Uh, they, you know, they, they had a huge influence. Their lives, Daniel, had a huge influence on, on, on kings, several kings, several kingdoms, several generations. That's the kind of ripple effect that a godly life can have on those around them. So, I just know, I just know that God wants us to learn from this Daniel series. That's the reason we're having it here. So that, so that we can make the same kind of impact on our families and on our communities that, that Daniel and his friends had. God has chosen the church. He's chosen the church to be the vessel the instrument that he's going to use to prepare the world for Christ's soon return. So think about this. If we don't make a difference, if the church don't make a difference, who's going to make a difference in the world? 
Look, look where the world's going right now. Look at, the, look at the moral decay that's taking place in the world right now. Even, even in, our, in our school systems, what's being taught. I mean, if we don't make a difference, who will? It's not going to be CNN. And I'm not going to pick, I'm not, I'm, this is not political. But I'm just saying it's not, it's not going to be anything like that. The world needs to know that there really is a God. The world needs to know that there's a God and that He cares about us. So, so, so far all of our lessons, Daniel has, Daniel has, has been the one that, um, all, of our, all the, our life lessons, that's what I'm calling these. He, he's the one that's really been the, the, the source. But Daniel chapter 4 is a little different. Daniel chapter 4 is, is not written by Daniel. All the other chapters in the Bible, uh, in, in Daniel, are written by Daniel himself. But in Daniel chapter 4, King Nebuchadnezzar is, is the one that, that is writing the book of Daniel. And, and, uh, and to, to put this in the right context, this king right here is one of the most warlike, bloodthirsty, powerthirsty kings in the whole entire Bible. Think about that. That's the context here. Now I want you to listen to this opening liner here. That he, in, in Daniel chapter 4 verse 1. Daniel chapter 4 verse 1. This is his opening liner. Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar the king. To all people. Nations. Languages. That dwell in all the earth. Now this is a message to the whole planet. To the whole planet. And this is what he says. He says, peace be multiplied to you. Get, yeah, peace be, sounds like Paul, you know. Uh, peace be multiplied to you. What happened to this guy? There was a huge change in this guy's life. This was real. I mean, a man of war, he went from a man of war to a man of peace. Verse, verse 2. He says, I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are thy signs. And how, how, how mighty his wonderful works. His, his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Remember what he was doing last week? He was all about his kingdom, right? His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And his dominion is from generation to generation. He said, you need to hear my testimony. You need to hear. Oh, oh, Daniel, let me write this one. Please, let me write this. They need to know what God has done in my life. I want to tell everybody that there's really a God. Our Father. I had it all wrong. God's been, it's almost like he said, God's been chasing me. And we've seen that. Through our series here. God's been chasing after Daniel. And he said, and he finally caught me. And I'm so glad he did. And he's just praising God. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was, was one of the most powerful world leaders in, in all earth's history. I mean, Babylon was his. The city of gold. I mean, this city was huge. It was huge. And it had 225 Thick walls that went all around them for protection. This huge city. Huge city. And, and the, it was so big they said that chariots could race around the walls. I mean, they, they, it had the river Euphrates that ran right through the very center uh, of, of, the, of the city. They didn't have to worry about anything. One of the most common things back in those days is that, that invading armies would surround the city and cut off the water supply and, and food supply and starve them out and then go in and take them. They didn't have nothing to worry about that. Historians say that they would f throw food over uh, to, the, to the other people. Uh, next week, Brian is going to be looking at, at some of this, how they were throwing a big party. You know, they, were, they, they, they didn't have anything to worry about. You know, during his time, Nebuchadnezzar was the most wealthiest man in the world. He was the most powerful man in the world. He was the best conqueror. In, in the whole world. He had won every world war he fought. He was the world leader. But he had one tremendously huge flaw. 
He had a pride problem. He had a he was incredibly arrogant. Top arrogant. He had it bad. This guy had it so bad that he built a 90 foot statue, a gold statue of himself. 90 foot? Can you picture 90 foot? Of himself. 90 foot statue. I mean, a lot of people nowadays like to take selfies, but, but, uh, they, but, but he, he built, this guy built a 90 foot gold statue. It, it's, could you picture a nine, do we have any nine story buildings here in, in Gentry? <laughs> could you picture even, we, we got a hilly, this was on a plane. Could you imagine how far you could see that? And this guy didn't stop there. He, what gall, you know. What audacity. He, he, he commanded everybody to come on a certain day and to bow down and worship Him. And what was He going to do if you didn't bow down and worship Him? Remember that last week? He's going to kill you. He's going to throw you in the fire. He's going to throw you in the fire. Pride. Since the very fall. If you go back and you, and you do the search, the fall. Pride. Lucifer had a huge pride problem. This is something that's been inherited from Lucifer. It's one of the biggest issues of the heart. Pride. You know, God had been working on Nebuchadnezzar for a long time. We've seen that. He'd been working. And I believe one of the last big things in Nebuchadnezzar's heart, the thing that had the root problem of his heart, was pride. And that's what we see God working on here in this chapter. In Daniel chapter 4, we see the relentless, persevering, not giving up, God's persevering search and to get our attention, to save us all, every single one of us. You know, this, this, this story right here in Daniel chapter 4, see, I didn't know when I, was, when I first started out, I admit, I thought, what am I going to do with Daniel 4? But I, as, I, as, I, as I prayed over it, as I, as I kind of cried out to God about it, as I went through all kind of deals this week myself, uh, as I went through the fire, in my little fire, God gave me this message. This is my testimony. But this is your testimony too. This is your story. This is the story of the whole human race. This is, this is ours right here. About, about a God that will not give up on us. That's relentless in His pursuit of us. That, that a Father that, that cares about His children that will not give up on you. A, a God that, that just keeps on. Uh, a God that's the amazing grace. The amazing grace of a God that, that over and over we've, we've shunned Him. We've, we've basically just spit on Him and we just walked away. But He, he, he will not give up on us. He would not give up on us. What a testimony that Daniel 4 is of God's power to save and His love for us. If God, if God can transform a warlike, bloodthirsty, power-thirsty, full of pride king like Nebuchadnezzar, there's hope for us. If God's grace can reach down and touch a heart of someone as, as, as terrible as Nebuchadnezzar was, there is hope for our loved ones that we say there's no hope for. Nebuchadnezzar tells us in, um, in Daniel chapter 4 verse 5. Daniel chapter 4 verse 5. Let's pick up. He says, you've got to hear my testimony. You've got to hear about God. Daniel 4, verse 5, he said, and we see that Daniel had a dream. And this dream, this dream scared him. It, it, it shocked him. Uh, he knew that it was something special. So, he, so what did he do? He called all his wise men, right? He called all his wise men and, um, and uh, you know, the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers, and he told them to dream. He told them to dream. And, and, and uh, uh, he always does that, doesn't he? He, he always goes to the wise men of the world, doesn't he, first? Yeah. Yeah, but he, he, he always... He, what, 
But, but at last, at last he turned to the man of God, Daniel. Why does he do that? Why does he always, you know, try everything else? Do we do that? Do, do we, is that our story too? Do we do that? Do we, do we, when we face with a problem, you know, something going crazy in our life, something that, that just throws us off guard and trips us up, and do, 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 we, do we get all frantic and, and crazy headed about it and worked up about it and, and try to do everything that we can on our own and, and call on anybody that we can? And then when we finally get to the end of our rope, do we do, we do that? Do we, is that when we call on God? Um, but, Verse 10. So, so Nebuchadnezzar tells Daniel, he says, I had this vision. I had a vision and, it, and it, it, this huge tree, this, this huge tree comes up and its, high, its height reached all the way to heaven and it just grew up and all the world, you could see it from anywhere in the whole world, th this huge tree. And, and, it was, and it was beautiful and it, and, it, and it provided all kind of food and all kind of shelter for everything and everyone. It provided for everyone and everything. But then, but then uh, verse 13, but then a, a holy one come, cried out from heaven and, and says, chop down this tree. Chop down this tree and destroy the branches. Destroy the fruit. But leave. But leave the stump and the roots in the earth. Verse 15. Held by a band of iron and brass. Go ahead and say praise God. Go ahead. Go ahead right now and say praise God for His amazing grace. Right here. For His amazing grace. He left the stump in the root. And, and then he says, and then he, he goes on to say, and let him graze, let the, the dew from heaven fall. Let him graze like an ox. Could you picture that? Like a wild animal grazing. Uh, in the field for seven years. Verse 17. In order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and, give it, and gives it to whoever He will and sets over it the lowest of men. Verse 18. Daniel, uh, he, Nebuchadnezzar says, Daniel, that's my dream. What does this mean? What, what is this? What is this? What does it mean? What in the world does it mean? Verse 19 kind of starts out that Daniel's speechless. Now the King James Version says that he was speechless for one hour. So could you imagine that? Could you imagine sitting in the presence of the king? You know. And I could imagine by, by, by the scripture here, in, 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 ver, in verse, verse 19, I could picture Daniel's face getting paler and paler. Speechless. Finally, ne Nebuchadnezzar says, Come on, Daniel, you've got to tell me. I know you know. I can tell you know. Go ahead and tell me. Just, just go ahead and get it out. And finally, finally, Daniel, Daniel speaks up very solemnly. He, sa he says, My Lord, may this dream concern those who hate you in its interpretation concern your enemies. I, I wish this was about your enemies, King. But it's not. It's about you. Did, did you notice how Daniel responded here? Do you notice this? I mean, this is the same king that destroyed his life. The very same one that destroyed his life. King, you're finally getting what you deserved. Yeah, about time. You're going down. <laughs> is, that, is that what he said? No, that's not what he said. You don't win your friends by wanting bad things to happen to them. That's just not the way God is. That's not the way God is. What, what do you think happened in Nebuchadnezzar's heart that took him from a man of war to a man of peace? What happened in his heart? It was the love. The love of God demonstrated through Daniel. The love of God. God used His love through Daniel to draw His heart out of Babylon. 
to draw his heart away from the things of this world. It was the love of God. Think about that. That's what changed Nebuchadnezzar. God had a servant that was willing to be emptied of self, emptied of pride. Said, here I am, God, use me. I sacrificed my life to, to be a vessel used by you so that you can use me to change the whole world. Worldwide leader got changed because God had an instrument that he could work through, that he could work his love, his unselfish love through, and turn Nebuchadnezzar to the one true God. What an influence, what an impact that Daniel had on the world because of that. Verse 20, but he goes ahead. Verse 20, the big tree in your dream, king, the one that reached to the heavens and seen by all that provided food and shelter for everybody, it's you, king. This is you. Verse 25, And they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like an oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and gives it to whomever He chooses. Insomuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you after you come to know that heaven rules. Therefore, therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being, by being righteous in your iniquities, by showing mercy to the poor. And perhaps there will be a lengthening of your prosperity. King, this doesn't have to happen. This does not have to happen. You don't have to go over fool's hill. You don't have to do it. You know, there are times when God warns us. He warns us maybe through a friend, maybe through a situation in our life. God is good about giving us warnings. He... Uh, he but if that doesn't work, He's not going to give up on you. He's going to keep on. He's going to keep on. You know, that should have been enough, right? That should have been enough. He knew the Spirit of God was in Daniel. He knew that, right? He knew the Spirit of God was in Daniel. And Daniel would say, don't do it, don't do this. You can, this can be avoided. That should tell us just how bad pride is. It should tell us how dangerous pride is in each one of our hearts. It will, it will take hold on us. It, 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 will, it will work in us because we're all broken. And this is something that we're all born with. We are born with this. Ah, ah. Every single one of us. You know. And we see here it was. One year later. One year later. He walked out on his back terrace. I could just picture him. The king spoke, Is this not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling in my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? And while the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice from heaven fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from you. And they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. Seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever He wills. Now here's a life lesson. We've got to understand this. God is much more interested in saving you than He is your comfort. That's right. I had a, yesterday, I had a um, small group meeting at my home. Some beautiful people come and we hung out together. But I had been kind of preoccupied this week and, and, and had spent a, hadn't had a lot of time to work on my yard. So I thought, I'm going to run out there and I'm going to mow my hay meadow. Because that's what it looked like. And uh, I did. I ran out there and I mowed on it and I mowed on it. And, and my lawnmower broke on me. 
<laughs> Front yard. And I thought, oh, Lord. <laughs> and, then, and I praise God I've been working on this message right here. <laughs> because God told me. Because I was feeling so sorry for myself. You know what God told me? <laughs> Rick, I am much more interested in the salvation of these precious children around here and I am your yard looking pretty. <laughs> That's right. Praise God. You know, if God's got to take away your comfort to save you, He loves you enough to do it. Amen? He loves you enough to do that. But he will leave the stump and the root in the ground. Yeah, I, I praise God that, that he didn't save me from my fire. That I was going to share with you last week. I had to go through a fire to get here. Not this week. I'm talking about a real fire went before I knew the Lord. I praise God that he didn't save me from the fire. He saved me in the fire. And sometimes that's where we got to get saved at. You know, I'm involved in prison ministry a lot. I've been more so even in the past. And I tell them young men, I said, look, if this is where God had to get you at to save you, then praise God. He's either got you here for two reasons. One is to save you, or, to, or two, to use you to save somebody else. Because a lot of them are there. They're innocent. You know, they didn't really do it. And so I, 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 so I always put that in there. <laughs> anyway. But, but see, was, was God being mean to me when, when, he, when, when, when he chopped down my little empire? I thought I had an empire. And I'd worked really hard for it. I had worked. This was my empire, you know. I'd worked really hard for it. But God knew something. My kingdom was going to burn. It's just Temporary. At the very least, at the very, at the very, at the very most, maybe seventy or hundred years. You know, I live my life like, like you know, like it, the, the euphoria. And my my whole kingdom and everything was going to be right here. This is nothing right here. This this earth was nothing right here. You know, every bit of this is just temporary. God wanted to open up my eyes that He's offering me eternity. And, and beyond, our eyes have, have not seen, our ears heard, or we can't wrap our mind around, our imagination can't even can come up with what God has got provided for us. We sell out so cheap when we cling to the things of this world. We're going we're gonna to walk on the things that we cherish here. We're going to walk on the streets of gold. We have no uh, earthly imagination of, of what God has got planned for us. So what's the take home? What's his take on here? What's our life lesson? Watch out for pride. Watch out for pride in your life. It'll slip in there. It's already there. It'll just rear up his ugly head. And you know where pride comes from? It comes from the enemy. It comes from the enemy. And you're saying, Oh, pastor, you know, I've, I've, never, I've never walked out on a, on a terrace in a big palace and kind of beat my chest and, 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 uh, and, and said, all mine. I've never done that. No, you probably haven't, but I could imagine you walking out on your back deck. <laughs> Looking around, i got a nice place. <laughs> got a 52-inch television in there. <laughs> all mine. I'm doing pretty good. I could picture that. I'm not looking at anybody directly in your eyes. <laughs> but, uh, and, and then there's the truck. Four-wheel drive. That's right. My truck. Did you, do you know the truck that nowadays, they cost more than a Cadillac? They do. These big four-wheel drive trucks cost more than a Cadillac. There, <laughs> there, there, there's a, this story comes to mind. This guy had, had uh, him and his wife drove up into town one day in their new Cadillac. 
drove up in town and, and uh, come up to a four-way intersection and right over there was the wife's ex-boyfriend. And, uh, and riding a mule. <laughs> and and the, uh, the, the husband said, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, honey. If, you, if you'd married him, you'd be riding on the back of that donkey right now. She swung her head around. She said, if I had married him, he'd be driving this Cadillac right now. <laughs> we got to watch pride. Seriously. We, we've got to watch pride in our, in our life. Here's the whole point. We've not got anything that God didn't give us. Okay? You don't have nothing. You came from nothing. You'll go to nothing. This life is temporary. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. It's really that simple. Anything that you've got, God is the one that's given it to you. Your job, your house, your, your, your business, your assets, your talents, your health, even this beautiful truth that we have. Do you realize it's by the grace of God that, that you have the truth that you have right now? It's not, religious pride is dangerous. It does not draw anybody to Jesus. Everything is given to you from God and by God, including us. He created you. We belong to God. He created us. He redeemed us. And He paid a huge price for us. Why? Because He loves us. I was talking to the young people and I said, you were not an afterthought. You were a pre-thought. God created you. He planned you out. There is nobody like you on this earth. There's not another you that exists. God created you for eternity. There's a special place in His heart that can only be filled by you. There will be an empty place in his heart as he does not catch you. We're running from him. We're deceived. And, and, and he's trying to get our attention. He's our father. He loves us and he's did everything he can to save us, including the price that he paid on Calvary. Imagine what he went through to save each one of us, to get our attention. But we can reject him. Now I want to I wrap this up. In this story right here, uh, God never leaves Nebuchadnezzar. He never leaves him. I mean, think about how ruthless, warlike. I mean, he, people, he, he crushed Jerusalem. God's people. I mean, he, he destroyed lives. But God never gives up on this guy. The root and the stump are still in the ground. He, and he never gives up on you. God has not given up on you. He's still chasing you. He's still after your heart. He still loves you. When, when, you're, when the tree of my life gets chopped down and things seem hopeless, the stump and the root remain. The roots go deep. I have hope in Jesus Christ. I have hope in Him. That He's going to get me through this. That He's going to help me. That He's going to carry me through this. In verse 34. 2,500 years later, this word of an ancient king gives us hope that we can close with. And at the end of time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven. And my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High. And I praised and honored Him who lives forever. For His dominion is everlasting dominion. And His kingdom is from generation to generation. Don't you love this? At the, at the end of the time. This finally came to pass. You need to understand this. 
If you're going through a deep, dark valley right now, if you're going through what you think might be the most horrible time of your whole life, it will end. God's going to get you through this. And if you hold on to Jesus, and if you look to heaven, this road you're walking down, no matter how tough it is, will eventually lead to eternal life with Jesus Christ, your Father, God the Father, and Jesus. Praise God. Hold on. How do you do this? By lifting up your eyes to heaven. Take your focus off what you're going through. Put your focus on heaven. Lift up your eyes to heaven. Look to Him. I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know uh, how deep your valley is. I don't know what kind of sin has got a hold of you right now. But I know that God's love and grace can reach down to you right where you're at. Right where you're at in this life right now. His grace is bigger than our sin. Bigger than our past. His grace is. It's a Father that never gives up on us. So, do you recognize yourself in this story here? As we went through it, do you recognize, you know, that, do you realize that you're royalty? Does that sink in? It took me a while to get it. Maybe you might need to go home and think about this, but do you realize that you're a child of the King? You're not a nobody, you're a somebody. You're somebody very special to God. Very, very special to Him. And He cares about you. And He loves you, Stacy. You are a child. You are a child of the King. A child of the Most High God. What's happened to us, though, is because of sin, we've lost our royal robe of righteousness. But because of Calvary, all we've got to do is look to heaven. Look to heaven. Look and live, Isaiah says. Look and live. John the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Look and live. See, we've all been deceived, just like Nebuchadnezzar. But God's trying to get our attention. He hasn't given up on us. We can claim our birthright today. Today. Ask God to remove the scales that you could really see. Maybe you've been living your life like there's not a God, wrapped up in your own little kingdom. But God's trying to get your attention today. I've got something so much bigger, so much better planned for you. Nebuchadnezzar lifted up his heart toward heaven. And God heard his heart cry. The heart cry of one of his children, a son of God. And when you lift up your heart today, when you lift up your heart cry to God, He will recognize your voice. Your heart cry, just like he recognized Nebuchadnezzar, because you are his child also. You are one of his children that he's chasing. Jesus' arms were open wide for Nebuchadnezzar. And Jesus' arms are open wide for you, each one of you, every single one of you. Are you tired of running from God? Are you tired of running? Let him catch you. Let God catch you. Let him, let him have all of you. In John tr chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus says, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. One of my favorite little books, besides the Bible, is a book called Steps of Christ. In that book, when I first started seeking God and looking to Him, I read a little quote there in that book that said about John 12, 32, and it says, The sinner may resist this love, but if he does not resist this love, if you don't resist the love that God is, is pouring out on you right now, He will continuously draw you closer and closer and closer to you each day. Let's stop running from God. His amazing grace. I'm going to ask Jody to come up and, and um, He's going to lead us out in, in Sylvia in, in a beautiful song called Amazing Grace. And I want to invite each one of you to stand. And I want to invite each one of you, or to encourage each one of you, to cry out to God with your heart. And I promise you that, that the same God that, that heard the heart cry, that heard the heart cry 
of a warlike, power-thirsty, blood-thirsty king like Nebuchadnezzar will hear your heart cry. If there's hope, if God's grace is big enough to save Nebuchadnezzar, then His grace is big enough to save you. You know, praise God. This work, oh, I just pulled an audible. I uh, told Sylvia we're going to do this a cappella. Oh. And uh, because of what this song was written, John Newton was a slave boat captain. I don't know if you knew that, Amazing Grace. And this is a, in a line called a white spiritual because it was written in the pentatonic scale, which is all the black keys. Most all Negro spirituals are written on the black keys, and this was, called, this was a white spiritual. And they thought that he actually heard this melody coming from underneath, from the slaves. He'd hear that, and I'm going to start off just humming. And just close your eyes and picture yourself in slavery down in the bottom of a ship, slave to sin. And hear this melody that became one of the most popular Christian songs ever. And then join, stand and sing with me all four verses when I get, when I get done humming. I 
have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun, we've no last days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Praise God. Wow. Tim, you got anything else to share? Come up here. Thank you, Jody. Powerful. I want you to share anything that God's got on your heart and closes in prayer. I have a burden that the Lord would get through to me with these wonderful messages. These old hearts, they're hard to surrender. They're incredibly stubborn. Well, I'm guilty, and I need his amazing grace. I need it. I know we all need it. And I know that the amazing grace needs to be displayed in our hearts that everybody else can see it. It starts at home. It starts at home, folks. And then it's here at our church and beyond. Yeah. So I'm, I'm asking through this series that God does an incredible work on every one of us. Let's pray that he can do it. Heavenly Father, as we close the day, we hear your voice talking. And we want it to be real in our lives, real in our hearts. Nothing fake about us as we go out this door, but all surrendered to you. Lord, come in in a powerful way that you can use us to win all of our family, win all of our friends, win all of our co-workers. Lord, we want a big group, not just half, not just one out of 20. Lord, we're asking for everybody. We're asking for big power here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.